Good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. And perhaps this is your first time joining with us. We trust that you'll be greatly blessed and enriched by viewing this today. Well, Friday mornings are dedicated to bringing a, another voice from Cornerstone uh, specifically for our young people. And so we want to introduce Brother Elijah Knudsen. Please stay tuned. I think you'll be greatly blessed. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Good morning and God bless you. First of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Bishop Mayo for the opportunity to present uh, the young person's devotion this morning. Uh, my prayer is that it'll be a, be a blessing to all of you. Let's start off with a word of prayer. God, I love you and I worship you. Thank you for this opportunity to come into your house, to come into your presence, God, and to dedicate this morning to you, Jesus. I pray that you would let this time be blessed. Help me to convey what you put on my heart. Let it be a blessing to others, God. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would help our church, God, to, to glean from this and spread it throughout our world. You know, these are perilous times, God. These are end times. Help us to be your light and your example in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, to start off, I'd like to simply title this, The Gift That Nobody Wants. Beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 3, I'd like to read a few verses of Scripture. Um, starting in verse 16, this is after Adam and Eve have sinned. They've eaten of the forbidden fruit. God has come into the garden and confronted them, and they're preparing to receive God's judgment, his curse on mankind. Beginning in verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shalt bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The portion of scripture that I've just read to you is, at least from my finding, the first mention of pain in the Bible. Because of sin, God introduced a new element into the experience of life on earth, pain. And as all of us can attest to, that experience is still alive and well today. Everyone has experienced pain and multiple kinds of pain. Phrases such as mental anguish, agonizing pain, and shooting pain, followed by commonplace terms like mind-numbing pain, broken-heartedness. These are all familiar phrases that we know that describe pain in not only our bodies, but our minds and our souls. The society we're a part of has long ago identified that pain is to be avoided at all costs. I won't go into too much detail today as I'm sure most of us are pretty familiar with the concept, but America and the rest of the Western world are, are desperate to avoid pain alcoholism, drug abuse, the current opioid crisis, as well as many and varied emotional walls that we surround ourselves with are all aimed at a singular purpose, to keep pain away. Today, I'd like to take the time to go back and re-examine this avoidance stance toward pain. As we read earlier, God was the one who created pain as a part of human life. Why did God do that? Was it a precursor of the wrath to come? Was it his way of punishing Adam and Eve for their sin? Or could this new sensation be a gift in disguise? With the help of a few examples, I'd like to show you a couple ways that I believe God uses pain, not as a punishment, but firstly, as a warning, and secondly, as his sign that better things are yet to come. To start off, pain as a warning. The title of this devotion, um, it actually comes from a book uh, by Dr. Paul Brand, a man who in the late 
I think it was all the way from the 40s around to the 90s, he gave his life to the care and rehabilitation of lepers all over the world. In his book, he describes the true condition behind leprosy, the gradual deadening of the nerves in certain parts of the body. Contrary to popular belief, Dr. Brand speculated and then proved that the characteristic symptom of leprosy, which is the, the disintegration of the extremities of the body, had nothing to do with the common misconception of bad flesh. There was no flesh rotting away. This did not happen in leprosy. His discovery was that the simple loss of feeling was enough to do the job. Remember the thorn and the thistles that God spoke of in Genesis and cursed Adam with? It turns out that pain actually protects us from these dangers, warning us to stop, stay away. Pain is the only thing keeping our bodies from damage. When you lose the sensation of pain, you open yourself up to damage and even debilitation. Pain warns us away from handicapping our own selves. There is no other process in the body designed to do this. Likewise, the pain of the heart, the pain of the conscious, warns our spiritual man away from danger. Sin is debilitating. Sin will handicap your potential. Sin will use you up and leave you useless, drained of all possibility. The, plan that God, the plans that God has for you are limited by your willingness to heed the voice of your conscience and stay away from sin. David understood this concept perfectly. Reading from Psalm chapter 119, verses 67 and 71, 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Verse 71 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. One of the meanings of that word afflicted literally means to hurt. David was saying it is good that he experienced pain because it taught him to walk in God's ways and warned him away from danger. Just like the Jews in Acts chapter 2, the pricking of the heart, the pain from the conscious, can remind us to flee from sin and turn towards God. So don't become like a leper, silencing the voice of the Holy Ghost and a God-given conscience. Keep that voice alive, even if it's speaking the language of pain, and let it warn you away from danger. Just like David, on the other side, you'll learn to thank God for it. Secondly, I'd like to say that pain, I, I phrase this a, a little bit of a, a different way, I hope it makes sense at the end, pain as an indicator of battle. I think we can all understand that God uses pain to help guide our lives away from danger. But what about when we try our best to serve him, listen to the warnings from our conscience and avoid sin, and our life is still filled with pain? This reminds me of the story of Job. So Satan talks to God, and because God trusts Job, as I'm sure we're all familiar with the story, he allows Satan to try Job. Satan moves in and destroys all of Job's worldly possessions and even causes his children's house to collapse, killing them all. At the, end, Job, uh, at the end of Job losing pretty much everything he owns, as well, of all, as well as all of his children, he is in great emotional pain. Then the devil turns it up a further notch and attacks his body. Job chapter 2 reads like this in verse 7. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his head, from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Job is in some serious pain. Later in the book of Job, his friends assume that God is punishing him for sinning. Why else would all this be happening? But Job had a revelation, the same one that Jesus Christ had during his suffering. He understood that the pain he now felt was not there to destroy him. His pain existed to develop him. Battle was taking place. His future hung in the balance. His response to the pain he was now experiencing would determine his salvation. On one hand, maintain his integrity and bless the Lord. On the other hand, curse God and die. We know that his story ends with God blessing him with twice as much as he had known before, simply because he endured through the pain, keeping his integrity intact. 
He didn't go out and sin. He didn't start questioning or disobeying authority. He didn't make foolish choices. He talked with God, stayed humble, and submitted himself to God's process. We find the same example in Jesus Christ. Before his death, he prayed in agony, sweating drops of blood. He was arrested. He was stripped. His beard was pulled out. He wore a crown of thorns. He was beaten. He suffered pain unimaginable. He walked up Mount Golgotha and was nailed to a cross. He hung there. He was pierced in the side with a spear, and he died, suffering incredible pain and with all power in heaven and earth. Why in the world would God manifest in flesh, submit himself to pain? Why wouldn't he numb his body, deviate from God's plan in order to avoid this? Because he understood that without this process of pain, the wonderful work of redemption could not be accomplished. Despising the shame, he endured with patience in order to give us life. The incarnation of God without the suffering and the death is simply incomplete. Humanity would not have been radically impacted if Jesus had come to the earth, performed his miracles, his great miracles, but ascended again without suffering and dying on the cross. His pain was the medium that brought about the full potential of the Lamb of God, which is the acceptable sacrifice for our sins. In conclusion today, I'd like to take you back to the first scripture we read today in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. It's the, like I said, as far as I could find, the first mention of pain in the Bible. When you look at that verse again, though, it isn't all punishment and misery. A promise accompanies this gift. With the sorrow that God gave Eve came the promise of childbearing. Your pain is not pointless. Your frustration is not without end. The tensions and disappointments we experience in life are not just here to make life harder. The truth is, yes, God gave us pain, but he also reminds us that it is out of pain that great things are born. So I encourage you today, young person, I challenge you to look at your pain differently. How is God trying to speak to you? Is this pain, this discomfort a warning? Or is this, the, or is this current pain the process he is using to develop you into greatness and in, in usefulness in the kingdom of God? I pray this has been a blessing to you. God bless you.